I can look at that in many scenarios. Sometimes we don't have some big positive outcome, but we learn a purpose through a no. Right. Right? We learn a calling through a no. Um, we learn a lesson. We build strength. We build resiliency. We appreciate the beautiful moments so much more when we've gone through the tough ones. I believe our life comes down to the moments when we trust our knowing mm -hmm. over the no's. Mm -hmm. Our knowing over what we can't see in front of us, what 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 looks like, you know, is it going to happen or, mm -hmm. or, or is it going to come to... You have nothing but closed doors in front of you. Yes. And a ton of product and no money. Yes. What is the turning point? Yes. Why did you not give up? Yeah. So two big things happened. The first uh, was in the form of a crazy painful rejection. So I thought, Mel, um, so we got a call from a big potential investor okay. and very famous for launching all these sort of unknown brands and making them big products we all buy in grocery stores. And, you know, and I thought, and they got in hold of our product. And I thought like, oh, if they invest, then A, I'm not going to go bankrupt. B, like they, we can leverage their, their, their clout to get in these stores that keep telling me no. Yeah. Like I had this whole scenario planned out that was like this pretty woman moment, right? Where I was like, oh, he's going to save the day. <laughs> and so we started taking meeting after meeting uh, and, and we, it got down to the final meeting with this huge investment firm. And uh, it was in person. My husband and I actually flew to the meeting. And the head guy was about three feet from me. Yeah. And his whole team was there, who was awesome. I had just presented our whole future product pipeline. And he says, you know, you should be so proud of this product you're created. you've created. It's really, really good. Uh, but it's a no. We're going to pass on investing in it cosmetics. And I was like, okay, can you tell me why? Because I'm so used to hearing no. And I was yeah. like, okay, even though really I was devastated. But well, yeah, because they just led you on and you just went through it. And this was supposed to be the meeting where they're like, let's do this. And I was so hopeful and I was so desperate. Yeah. And um, he says, he got very quiet and he says to me, do you want to know, you know, do you, or what? I said, I said, can you tell me why? And he says to me, do you want me to be uh, really honest with you? And I said, yes, please. And he got really quiet and he's like three feet from me in person. And he says, I just don't think women will buy makeup from someone who looks like you with your body and your weight. And when he said that to me, and this is why it was such a big moment for me. When he said that to me, first of all, a lifetime of body doubt and self-doubt. Like I remember it flooding my body all at once. And when I looked at him, I actually felt no anger toward him. I felt like I was almost like staring my own fear. Um, straight in the eye, but when he said those words to me, Mel, and this is what this is when we talk about purpose and intuition. He said, "I just don't think women will buy makeup for someone who looks like you with your body and your weight." The second he said that, I felt this feeling in my gut, like I can remember it like it was yesterday. This like strong feeling that said he's wrong, like I felt it right. And I didn't know how I was going to prove it, but I felt that feeling. And what I realized later, when I look back at that moment, this guy, this dude, gave me a no. But God gave me a knowing in that moment, in that moment. And I believe every one of us has had someone tell us we're not the right fit or no, or you don't have what it takes. Sometimes we're the ones telling ourselves that. I don't love you anymore. Yes, yes, right? But if, if you get still and you learn to hear your knowing, I believe which one you listen to. If you listen to the no, all the no's, all the rejections, all the self-doubt, or you get still and listen to you, your knowing, whether that's from your own intuition, from your creator, from the universe, whatever speaks to you, but we all have it. We all have it. And I believe our, 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 our life and our purpose and, and our entire destiny comes down to which one we listen to. Do you listen to the no or do you listen to the knowing? Okay. I promised a masterclass. That right there is worth a billion dollars. In life, are you going to listen to the no? Or are you going to listen to the knowing inside of you? That's it. Yeah. As somebody who loves you and as your friend, when you shared that story with me and hearing you tell it again right now, I literally go, I'm going to kill that motherfucker. I, I go, <laughs> I have that, my knowing goes, oh, yeah? <laughs> oh, yeah? You think, okay, okay. Yeah. Okay. Let me, let me show you. Like, it's that, like, I get that sort of mojo thing going when somebody 
says no like that at a moment like that. It's like, I'll show you. Yeah. And I guess I just got in this moment sort of this wake up call that my knowing often feels like I'll show you. Yeah. You missed out. You'll be sorry. What does yours sound like? And it's almost always true. That's almost always true, right? What does yours sound so, like? So is yours yep. like, mm, or is it more of like... I mean, in that case, I was devastated and at the same time had the strong... It, it was just a piece. Honestly, in that moment, it was a piece he's wrong and that didn't make sense in my head. Why? Because I had had three years of hundreds of rejections. And this is the thing, right? Jay-Z says the genius thing we did was we didn't give up. Mm. That's it, like one of my favorite quotes of his. In that moment, everything told me to give up, Mel. I mean, it was hundreds of rejections. And now it felt what felt like my last hope of desperation told me something totally different. No, because not only do I not believe in anything you're doing necessarily, but I actually just think you're personally not the right fit. Like women just won't buy makeup from it was just like, oh my gosh. It was like all of these no's everywhere. And 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 I want to share that because you know, it's easy for someone to go, oh, wow, she built a billion dollar company. She must have just got lucky. Or maybe she just had so many connections. Or We always think, but, but really what it comes down to sometimes, in this case, that big moment for me, do you listen to the knows or do you listen to the knowing, right? Yeah. And, and, and I made that decision that day to trust the knowing, to trust myself. I kept feeling like I was supposed to keep going. I didn't know how, right? And What do you do when you don't even know the next step? So you got this kind of, you know, jerk who's like, yeah, yeah they're not going to buy it because of your body type and this, that, and the other thing. You're like, yeah, yeah you're wrong, motherfucker. Yeah. But what do you do next? And, and so the next right step, the next thing that feels right when you can't even see how the how, heck it's How do you even out. determine what the next right step is? Yeah, you just get, for me, I just get still. I pray. I pray. Yeah. You know that. Yeah. I pray. Uh, and I just, but whether for you, you know, listening, it's prayer or it's the universe or, mm. or your intuition, when you get still. All you can do is try to listen, right? And, and try to live that answer, whatever it is, and take that next right step. And I just felt, I just had this knowing I was supposed to keep going. And even when it didn't make sense. And, and you know, I remember crying myself to sleep. I remember writing in my journal, um, know your why, then fly, girl, fly. Mm. And I read those words every day till I didn't need the reminder. Um, I would Google stories of people that had gone through thousands of rejections who no one would know that they went through them because they're so successful today. Or, you know, and I just kept trying to sort of build this toolbox of things I could lean on. Um, but I, And how did, how did QVC come about? Because oh, yeah. you built it cosmetics and it became because of you the most successful beauty brand on all of QVC you did yeah. over a thousand appearances yeah so how did you even get onto QVC because that in and of itself is no small feat yeah well you know their their head guy of beauty who's like a legend had said no to me many times no you're not the right fit uh, and I happened to be at this this big beauty expo. And was this before or after this guy was like, no, we're not investing? After. After? After. So she has now gotten three years of no's. Yeah. They're almost out of money. Her intuition is knowing that she's going to fly, girl, fly. <laughs> so she is still showing up to a beauty expo yeah. where I want you to understand in the business world, it's like going to a convention where everybody that you have ever fooled around with who has then broken up with you is attending. <laughs> so everybody that has said no yes. to her, yes. you know, she walks in and it's like, oh, here's this chick again, <laughs> the it chick, right? Yep. The yep. it cosmetics person that has been sending me the stuff and calling me and we have told her no, do not make eye contact. So you are now I at this thing. <laughs> This describes it exactly. Yes. Everyone you fooled around with, who broke up with you, and they're like, oh, don't make eye contact. Yeah. Oh, it's God, that. this chick again yeah. with, the, with the skin. with the Okay. Yeah. So you're at this thing. You've yes. been told no by the big, 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 big person. It's been three years. So we're talking like 2011, 2012-ish. 
What do you do? So I, uh, so you you get this three foot table, right? It's a huge convention. There's six thousand women at this convention. <sighs> wow. They're walking up and down, and it's every beauty brand in the world. Are and they buying it for their stores or no? So what it is? It's it was this big um, cosmetic executive women award show. Okay. And why you're there is you are you get a three foot table. You're demonstrating your product. You're hoping that someone who walks by either wants to carry your product in their stores mm-hmm. or all the press is there. Right. They cover your product or or there's also you could win some big award. So I'm there, and and then all the brands you can imagine, right, are there. And there's six thousand women walking. And when I got there, I saw QVC had this huge booth in the background, and you're not allowed to leave your table, right? And I couldn't afford to get kicked out. Um, but I just kept having this feeling like, okay, I've called them a million times. They've told me no forever, but I've never like met anyone in person, right? So I kept trying to sneak away from my table. And every time I got over there, the buyers would would be mobbed with people. Mm. I eventually got over there, made my way to one of the buyers, introduced myself, poured my heart out. Like with, I remember sweat just dripping (laughs) through my clothes because I was freaking out down to no money. Um, I'll cut a real long story short, but she gave me her card. um, And, uh, you know, it's like when someone says, oh, DM me on Instagram. You don't know if they meet you. They really mean it. Then you're on your Instagram checking your DMs and you're like, oh, they still haven't replied. And I thought, is that what it's going to be like? But she actually meant it. And I, I flew out, had a meeting with her. We got a yes, my first big yes, for one shot on QVC. And what it meant, Mel, was I was going to get this 10-minute segment live on the air, live in front of 100 million homes, and I either had to sell enough product to hit their sales goal yep. um, or not come back. We were only doing one to two orders a day on our website. Okay. And <laughs> one <laughs> to two orders a day, everybody. Yep. After yep. Yep. Three almost years. four, yeah, three years mm-hmm. of this. Yeah. Oh, this and is barely like, keeping the lights on. Um, and so now you get this, you get your shot. Like I there are those shot. moments in life. Yes. You're at bat. Yep. And you got to be ready for those. Yeah. And so put us right there with you. What happened? Yeah. What happened was I was about to learn one of the greatest life lessons I've ever learned to this day. Um, and he- here's what I mean by that. So I found that I get one shot. And uh, then I learn it's consignment, which means they, uh, so first of all, I had to sell over 6,000 units of our concealer in this 10 minute window to hit their sales goal or not come back, which was about like $130,000 or $140,000 of product in a 10 minute window. I also want to point out to everybody, that's 10 years of sales on her website at the current amount. So in 10 minutes, everybody. Yeah. She, on live television, yeah. has to move 10 years worth of volume she was selling on her website at that time. In one shot. Like one. In one shot. And she'd never done this before. I realize you were a television anchor, but this is a totally different thing. Well, QVC, it's, I mean, you know, it's unlike stores where you can walk in and there's thousands of products in one space. Their one minute of airtime can get one product. So you're competing with the volume of like Apple iPhone or Dyson vacuum. You have to hit these high sales goals. Yeah. And what I quickly learned was the offer was consignment, which meant I wasn't guaranteed to be paid for it. I had to figure out um, how to get a loan to cover the cost of manufacturing uh, 6,000 units of product, shipping it in, going through legal, going through QC, going through all of it. And then I learned if I go on air and it doesn't sell, I have to take it all back oh my God. and therefore go out of business, right? So you should never, ever, ever accept a purchase order you can't afford to lose uh, ever. But at this point, it was like, I think I'm, I don't know what this else is to it. do. This, this is, is it. This is the shot. This is it. And so here's what happened. We went to 22 banks uh, that all said no, and they probably should have. Um, the 23rd bank, which was California Bank and Trust, and uh, gave us a, a loan that covered our very first um, – purchase order and a little bit more. So I took the little bit more. We hired third-party consultants. I'm like, I'm going all in. I want to do the best 10 minutes yeah. I could possibly do. I, I want to I have no regrets. And they all told me the same thing. Which is? Which is, if you want a chance at making it, here's what you need to do. You need to use this type of model to demonstrate your product, which is flawless skin, early 20s, all the same skin tone. And I'm like, okay, But that's inauthentic. That's not why I'm building this brand. I'm like, what if 
I put models in their 70s and then and, and someone with hyperpigmentation and someone with acne. And, and, and what if I take my own makeup off on national TV and I could prove live how the product works? And they were mortified. And here's the thing, Mel, they wanted me to win. Like they were giving me the best advice that they know how. And I This had never been done. So we're is this 2011? This is 2010. Yeah. So 2010, 2010, everybody. Mm -hmm. So this was not something people did. Yeah. Like we're talking about the person who changed the industry mm -hmm. right here. And this is the moment you're hearing it. And everybody that were the quote experts yeah. were saying no. And this goes back to one of the major takeaways that you were learning from our professor of purpose, Jamie Kern Lima. And that is there's a huge difference between a no and a knowing. Mm, yeah. And if huge. you're the only you that will ever exist, your knowing is the unique difference that you're gonna make in this world. Yes. And in this moment, with one shot to go, everything on the line alone from one out of 23 banks that was willing. She said, no way to the freaking experts. And she listened to her knowing. So when you walked into QVC with normal human beings, <laughs> no flawless yeah. models, no one with perfect skin, all ages, all body types. Yep. Yep. Did people say, wait, you can't take them on the air? Or was there any, like, were people like, oh, she's got, this is just going to be terrible? Like, what was that like when you walked in? Did they even know you were going to take your makeup off? Um, I let them, yeah, I let them know I wanted to. And QVC was great, you know. The, here's the thing about QVC is, like, they want everyone to be their authentic selves. It's just yep. this has never been done this way before. Okay. And I wish I could say it was easy for me to just go, I'm just going to go with my knowing. But the truth is I flew out there a week early, Mel. I sat in a rental car in the parking lot, cried every day. I actually second guessed myself. I'm like, if I do it, maybe I'll do it their way first. Then I'll make money. Then I'll do it my way. Uh, but I know that, you know, authenticity, you can't fake authenticity. And authenticity alone doesn't automatically guarantee success. But what I do know is in, in authenticity guarantees failure. Every time. Okay, everybody, stop the professor classes in session. Did you hear that? That inauthenticity, being fake, mm -hmm. trying to do something everybody else's way because that's just you're too insecure to do it your way, yeah. that never guarantees success. Yeah. Authenticity, your knowing, your special spin on things, yeah. that is the pathway to purpose and success. Yeah. There is no other way. And so after a week of crying in your rental car in the parking lot at QVC, mm -hmm. you were like, I'm going with the knowing. I'm going with the knowing. And um, so tell us about that first appearance. You're standing there on a television set. There's yep. a bazillion cameras. The lights are bright. Yeah. You got your models there. Yep. You're taking the risk of your lifetime on live television in front of 100 million homes. Yes. You are doing something that has never been done on television before. Yeah, I remember literally I wore two pairs of Spanx, Mel. Not because I cared how I looked, but like I was so freaked out. Like my hands were shaking and I was sweating through my clothes. So I had on double Spanx under my dress. And I remember the moment the, the camera went live, right? And there's a big countdown clock on the floor that started at, at 10 minutes. And by the way, a minute or two before I went onto the set, I learned you're not guaranteed your 10 minutes. Why? If you are a minute or two into your cell and you're not hitting numbers, they know by the second. Your clock, you might think you have eight minutes still to go and your clock will jump to one or jump <gasps> to two minutes left. Because yeah. your product's a flop. Yep, exactly. And you're a flop. It, so you literally are racing against the clock to be successful out of the gate. So what did you do to like hook everybody? Did you take your makeup off right away? Did you like, yeah. what did you do? So, so I, first of all, I go out of the, you know, I, I go live. I remember it was like 959, 958, 958. And I'm like, oh, and I remember I had practiced in my bathroom mirror, right? So many times. If I had known the high five habit then, I would have been way more <laughs> confident. But I was practicing in the bathroom mirror this demonstration a million times on my wrist, how our concealer doesn't crease and the best two selling concealers crease. And I'd done this demonstration like this where I show it and they all start to crease. So I'm holding my wrist up, trying to do this as we go live to show that, but my, but my hand's like this now. And it was never like shaking when I was doing it a million Meaning times. it wouldn't bend everybody. Like she yeah. was so... 
so anxiety ridden <laughs> that yes. she's sweating through her two pairs of pangs, spanks yes. and her wrist will not bend so she cannot demonstrate that her product won't crease. Yes. And the host grabbed my wrist and was like, thank you, sugar. And she took over. <gasps> and then I remember my bright red bare face before shot coming up on national television. I remember walking over to our models, real women, all shapes, sizes, skin tones, skin challenges, calling them beautiful, meaning it. Uh, I remember. Do you, did you take, so when did you take your makeup? When so, she grabbed your hand and said, thank you, sugar. Yeah. Yeah. Did that wake you so up sweet. or were you like, I, no, I didn't, it was like out of my body. I was so just do you, praying. did you like just then take your makeup off? Well, they did a whole bare face before shot of me for that show. I oh. have, ta I've taken it off live a million times okay. since that okay. first show. It was like, yeah, bare face before shot. And then the after, um, and I remember walking over to them. I remember we were, gosh, six or seven minutes in. I didn't know how we were doing, but I knew we weren't cut yet. Um, and then it got down to like a minute left and the host said, uh, uh, the deep shades almost gone, the tan shades almost sold out. And I was like freaking out. And I remember literally right at the 10 minute mark, this giant um, sold out sign came up across the screen and I start crying on national television. <laughs> oh, I love you. They cut from me and went to like Dyson vacuum or something. <laughs> Um, and I remember my husband came rushing through the double doors of the studio and I, and, and he's like, has his arms up and I'm just sobbing and I'm like, real women have spoken <laughs> and I'm just like crying. And I thought he was going to give me a hug or be all excited. And he just looked at me and he's like, we're not going bankrupt. <laughs> and I was like, ah! <laughs> and I just, that one airing, which was September of 2010, uh, became five more that year than 101 the next year. And then I did 250 live shows a year um, myself, direct live on, on, on QVC year after year. So we built the biggest beauty brand in QVC's history. And the only reason that I share that is because it was years of no, and mm. you're not the right fit. And, 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 and what I love for, for anyone listening who needs to hear this is no one can tell you you're not the right fit. No one. And you can get all the no's in the world, but you have your knowing. And, 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 and by the way, I believe this, Mel. I believe even when you trust your knowing and then it seems like it was wrong and things don't go your way over and over and over. Like I look back at those moments, right? I really wanted that investor to invest in us. Thank God he didn't. Oh when God. I say everything's happening for us, what I mean is like, if he, I was so desperate that if he would have invested in us then, I probably would have given him the majority of the company for probably right. almost no money, right. right? By the time, many years, six years later, after that day, six years later, when um, L'Oreal bought this little company and started in my living room for $1.2 billion cash, it was still, I was the largest shareholder. Paula and I were the largest shareholders. And I look back and it's like, oh gosh, thank God. Uh, the the all the no's happened when they did, even when they sucked, even when it felt like it wasn't fair. Mm. Um, and I can look at that in many scenarios. Sometimes we don't have some big positive outcome, but we learn a purpose through a no. Right. Right. We learn a calling through a no. Um, we learn a lesson. We build strength. We build resiliency. We appreciate the beautiful moments so much more when we've gone through the tough ones. So. Have you ever seen that investor since? <laughs> I have not seen him. Uh, the day that we... Of course, I asked the petty question. I'm like, have you ever like seen him to like <laughs> twist the little knife in there? Okay. So, so uh, I heard from him one time ever mm -hmm. again, and it was six years later, the day that L'Oreal announced the deal. So because they're a public company, they announced... Um, you know, that they had acquired at Cosmetics, maybe the first woman to hold a CEO title of a brand in their 107-year history. They did the big press release. So that's kind of surprising. 107 years, L'Oreal, a makeup company. You're, it's ta it took them that long to have the first female CEO of a brand? I hope they have many more now. That is my yes. prayer. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You, were, you were the trailblazer there too. It's, uh, it's been, yeah. So many things. <laughs> it's been a journey. And here's the thing, Mel. It was another woman inside L'Oreal. It was Carol Hamilton, who was head of luxury for North America. She'd been there, gosh, 30 plus years. And she championed mm. for me to keep my CEO title, all the things. Like it was another woman saying, oh, and, and it's funny because I actually think she should have been the first woman. You know what mm, I mean? And I think, mm -hmm. again, um, there's an example, by the way, of, of 
I believe, I'm not going to speak for her, I believe she knows. This is my opinion. I think she probably knows she should be the first female CEO. But look how she used what she went through to then, boom, be of purpose and of service and help make sure that I kept my CEO title. Um, you know, everything we go through. Um, but so so they announced it, right? So all of a sudden it was a homepage of Wall Street Journal, the press everywhere. And that was the first time and only time since that I heard from that potential investor. And what did he say? He said, congratulations on the L'Oreal deal. I was wrong, is what he said, and wished me the best of luck. And uh, uh, That's a so big deal to admit you're wrong. It is. Um, and, uh, and so when you speak about petty, so I, what I did say to him was thank you. But what I wanted to say, <laughs> like, <laughs> what did you want to say? <laughs> so in that moment, here's what I thought about. I, I thought about, um, do you remember the movie Pretty Woman where, where like she goes in the store and they wouldn't help her? Mm -hmm. And then she goes back. Remember when she goes back? Yes. So I wanted to say to him, big mistake. Huge. Huge. <laughs> I could give you 1.2 billion reasons why it was a huge mistake. Um, but I didn't. I wouldn't have wanted to be him in that situation. You know, we probably would have been one of the most successful investments in this firm's history, you know. And so, listen, it wasn't uh, reject. I always say rejection is God's protection. Who's your biggest critic? And you can guess who they said. I'm assuming it was themselves. Mm -hmm. It was them. It was, yep. you know, them sitting there and being like, I am my biggest critic. And I just, yep. you just said you got a million no's. Like, is this a- <laughs> I love your mug. It's my boy. <laughs> it's oh, listen. <laughs> is this a woman thing? Is this a man thing? Is this a learned thing? You you obviously went through it. But how but somehow going through with all those no's, which a lot of these women are like, if I heard that many no's, I would just quit. How the heck do you deal with all those no's and then continue to believe in it? Yeah. I'm so, first of all, thank you for asking that question. Cause I think when we share these no's and we share this rejection, uh, again, back to what you guys do every single day, helps everyone feel less alone. So thank you for yeah. even asking that. I think this is huge. Cause when you Google my story, you don't see that. You just see like a fairy tale Cinderella story. And I realized from getting so many DMS on Instagram that, you know, women think like, Oh, did you just have connections or did you just get lucky or did you, and I'm like, no, and, and a big part of the journey was handling the no's and, and how. So um, so thank you for asking that. Yeah, just just to use, I guess, one, one quick story that's an example of this that maybe, because um, I think everybody listening right now probably has rejection in some form. And then how do you handle your own inner critic from like not taking over, right? I think when we when we, when we listen to our own inner critic and when we turn the volume up on that instead of learning how to turn it down, I think we end up literally talking ourselves out of our own truth and our own calling and our own purpose in, in this life. And so I think one of our greatest journeys, literally every human being and especially every woman and, and doubly, now that I'm a mom, now mm -hmm. that I'm a mom, because <laughs> I've been CEO of a billion dollar company and I've been a mom. Being a mom is harder. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Hand Listen down. Listen to that, ladies. Listen to that. A billion dollar company. Mom is harder. Mom is harder. And and I also noticed since being a mom too, which I love that you guys talk about this a lot, but my inner critic has gotten louder. And, and, and you know, comparison, all those things that every human being deals with, uh, I think, I think gets doubled down on us when we become a mom. And so I think learning how, and, and, you know, I talk about this a lot and believe it, this idea of how do you turn down the volume? Like I imagine, Kat and Matt, I imagine this imaginary volume dial literally in my own head. When I hear my inner critic come out that says, Jamie, you're not qualified or you're not enough or you're all these things. I have to literally imagine myself turning or by the way, by the way, sometimes it's our partner. <laughs> sometimes yeah. it's our friends and family who love us. Sometimes it's our kiddos. Sometimes it's whoever they mean well, but they say something like, are you sure you should quit your job and go after that? Or what do you know about doing that? Or, you know, all the things, right. And they mean well, but I've learned to like literally imagine this volume dial and I turn down the volume on that. And I have to, and this is a daily thing, by the way, still to this day, I have to like intentionally imagine myself turning up the volume 
on other words that replace those words that I know are true, even when they're hard to believe. Like, oh, you've all, you might you might have no experience in beauty, Jamie, but you you're gonna figure this out. Like you've always figured it out, or you're gonna work hard, or you're not gonna let you know no stop you. All those things, right? And I try to just turn down, turn up the volume on those things. And I think every single person in our daily lives needs to do this because what I think happens is we end up right. So I, so when I went on this three year journey of, of, of hearing no is the first three years of my company. And we got down to under a thousand dollars in our bank account, uh, which was personal and company combined. And I was like, I kept feeling in my intuition like this, I was supposed to be doing this. Like I was supposed to be creating this makeup company that solved my own skin problems and also helped to, to shift culture around the kind of images we see for beauty. And I just had this big dream and it kept feeling right. But sometimes like our, we start to second guess our own gut when there's no proof around us that we're right. And so for three years, it was like all the no's, all the beauty experts like Sephora and all the department stores and uh, QVC, they all said, no, you're not, yes, you're not the right fit. Um, we don't want to bet on you. We don't think you'll make us money, right? All those things. And when you have experts telling you they don't think you're going to make it. And then you have, you know, there's no proof around you that you're going to make it. And then you have friends and family worried about you. At the end of the day, learning how to turn down the volume on all that, including your own self-doubt and like hearing your own gut. For me, I've done a, a million things wrong in my journey. Um, and I share all those too in the book. But like one of the things I did right was, was I learned to hear my own gut and, and I made the decision to trust myself uh, when it said, keep going, I'm supposed to be doing this. Um, and that changed everything. You know, I feel like a lot of people, they get, they, you know, they fail or uh, they, they try and they fail. And then they're like, well, I don't have it in me to, to do more. They just feel so crushed, crushed by failing. And, you yeah. know, I, I, Kat and I, sometimes we joke because we were never, um, super successful like in school or in any of the traditional things where other people were shining so we're like every time something doesn't work out for us we're almost like we have great practice in failing we're like if something mm. really turns out well we're like well this is new this is very <laughs> exciting but when you say like you learn how to like trust your gut I think that like that inner it's, it's, it feels like it can be such a small thing inside you and people want to tune into that and they want to hear it it's like in their mind they know what they have is a great idea but they need to like they don't know how to do it is there a they feeling their gut. is there a feeling in your what's the gut yeah you yeah, it? yeah. oh oh gosh okay i'm so excited to share a thought with you <laughs> really fast i have a question for you if it's okay to ask do you guys think that part of like what you do now and why you're so successful everywhere um which i'll just say that about you because it, it's true um <laughs> We're do you feel like you're not afraid to fail? And that's a big part of it. And that's oh a big God, part of it. You know, yes. I think it's sort of our detriment too, because we also are, are shocked when we're successful. And, and, <laughs> you know, I think that when you learn, you know, I dropped out of high school, when you learn to not be afraid or ashamed of what or who you were, you let go of all these expectations. Like so many people are afraid to say, I can't afford it. You know what? I just can't afford it. Like, you know, this is, I don't have the money. Like I can't go out for dinner because I have no money in my bank account. Like all these secrets that we've been taught to keep or not share, you know, I'm having a hard time with my husband, right? I'm not, but like, you know, all these things where, ah, where rumors. no, like it's very, it's like, yeah you have to constantly front yourself. And I think that yeah. we're gifted at uh, our gift is being okay with our flaws. But I also think that yeah. like, although they were traditional failures, I think what it sort of showed us is that we don't have to follow the path where everybody else is successful. Like I remember when I wasn't going to be able to afford to go to um, university, which is you guys call it college, but yeah. it's not a community college, but university. I couldn't afford unless I, I took out loans. And I also didn't have the marks to get in. And I remember someone saying to me, like, you're never going to get a job if you don't go to university. And I was like, mm. I, and I remember thinking to myself, I don't necessarily think that's true. I I think I can be successful and not have to go spend all that money for the four years and maybe study something that may or may not apply to a job or something I want to do in the future. And so like the failures that look like failures to other people were sometimes just like if they were successes in other ways, you know? Totally. And one thing you just said too, that's so powerful is that when that person told you that you didn't, you already knew that they were wrong. You had that feeling like you knew, right? So you trusted yourself in that, which I think is huge. And one thing before I forget, oh my gosh, then I want to share something. Uh, 
this is so big um what you just said about failing i think too and just sharing too that like for, for all of us right because i'm part of your community too and and appreciate you everything how you guys show up in the world so much but for me and everyone else part of your community right now like listening to this i think this is huge because you watching your success and your impact and all the things in real time and then hearing that you're not afraid to fail right i think this is so big because when you look at like all the research it shows even even women it's like so many studies show that women won't ask for a raise until they meet 100 percent of the qualifications or won't ask for a promotion whereas men at 60 percent right? When they meet about 60% of the qualifications, they'll ask for a raise or they'll ask for a promotion uh, or apply for a job. And for women, it's a hundred percent. And it's because we're, from the time we're little, we become sort of people pleasers, perfectionists a lot of times. And also we're just, we're scared to fail. And we wait until we think we're going to have it perfect to, to, to go, take the dream and take the big step and launch the thing. And I feel like that is such a disservice because we end up literally never stepping into the person we're born to be. We end up staying in our comfort zone, like letting it chip away at our soul. Mm -hmm. And you guys are living, breathing examples. Um, and I hope and pray I am too, because I've been trying to, I've been, oh my gosh, there's been so many things where I've been like, you know what? It's because I wasn't afraid to fail over and over and over. And I wasn't afraid to get rejected over and over and over and over uh, that this eventually happened. Right. I and you know, one one big thing that um, uh, that stands out to me is, you know, we were a couple years into our company and just hearing no's from everyone. I didn't know that one day the company would be a success, but I just kept having this feeling kind of like when you just described the person said, oh, you need to go to, to university to make it. And you're like, oh, no, I don't think so. Right. I just kept having this feeling that I was supposed to be doing it. Uh, but and, but I didn't know how we were going to survive. And a couple years into the business, uh, we got a call from a potential investor. Um, and I was so excited because we were down to no money. And this investor ran this big private equity company. And they invested in all of these uh, consumer product companies that we all buy in the grocery store, like big names. that. And they invested in a lot of them when they were teeny tiny before anyone knew them and made them in household names. And I was freaking out because I'm like, oh, my gosh, if they invest in our company, A, I'm not going to go bankrupt. B, maybe they can use their leverage to get us into these stores that are, that yeah. are telling me no. I was so excited. And we started the meetings and uh, uh, meeting after meeting. And we got to the diligence phase, which is where we show them, you know, product, future product launches and projections and all that. And it came down to the last meeting. And I thought it was the day my life was going to change. And I'll never forget my husband and I flew up for the meeting and we were standing there about three feet away from the head guy. And he thanked us and he said, we really love your product, uh, but it's a no, we're gonna pass on you know investing in it that. cosmetics, right? Aww. And I sat there and I, I said, okay, can you tell me why? Can you give me some feedback? Cause feedback's usually a gift. And I'll never forget this moment in my life. It was a defining moment. And, and I think so many people will be able to relate to this because we all have these moments in different in different ways. Uh, but when I asked him like, oh, why is it a no? You know, he looked at me and he's like, he's like three feet from my face. Um, and he said, uh, do you want me to be really honest with you? And I said, yes, please. And he said, I just don't think women will buy makeup from someone who looks like you with your body and no, your weight. Oh my, did not. oh my God. Oh you my God. Freaking lying. Oh my God. <laughs> and I sat there. And it was wild because for me, um, you know, a lifetime of body doubt, like, like flooded my body all at once. And I was, was watching these words come out of his mouth. Two things happened though. And this is your story reminded me of this story. Two things happened in that moment. I mean, listen, I went to my car and bawled my eyes out. I had to figure out how to not replay those words over and over forever. Um, but in that moment, in that moment, when he's literally three feet from me saying those words, I remember like distinctly, I remember having this feeling in my gut, like deep down inside, like he's wrong. Just like what you just said about university. I was like, he's wrong. And, and I knew it, I felt it. Um, and, and, and I also realized, oh wow, this dude is passing on investing in my company because he's just as much, I don't wanna say a victim, but, but uh, impacted by the whole beauty industry too that tells like, you to look a certain way to make money right so yeah. it fueled me more to yeah. keep going um and one last thing to share just because i think like 
it's fun when we share our victories too, is um, yes. <laughs> six years later, the day uh, L'Oreal acquired it cosmetics, they, they did a big press release. So it went everywhere. Uh, when the day I sold my company, and it was all over the home pages of, of Wall Street Journal and everywhere. And I got a I hadn't heard from him in six years. And I actually got an email from him. Uh, and he said, uh, congratulations from that investor, the guy that said no. Yes. He said, uh, congratulations. Uh, I'm so happy for you. I was wrong. And wow. yeah. And, and and I this is the cool part about uh, life is I learned like it would have been the most successful investment in his firm's history, but but also Kat and Nat, I'm telling you there, there's a famous saying um, rejection is God's protection, uh, which you could also say rejection is the universe's protection, right? It's, it applies differently for everybody, but like had he had he not rejected me, I was so desperate at the time. I probably would have given him the majority of the company for almost no money and right. and thought and been and been grateful because he didn't believe in me, even though it sucked at the time, it was so painful. Um, fast forward six years, we were still of the biggest shareholders of the company when we sold it. So it was like life change. So thank God he didn't believe in me at the time. Um, and anyways, oh, sometimes I, I, you get these rejections and they suck, but like I, I try to keep that faith. I think totally. it's so important to remember, though, too, that f failure and rejection aren't like just because you can handle it doesn't mean you don't feel it. So you can totally, totally. feel like yes. you can get it. It can get you down. And that I think a lot of people think that, you know, rejection and failure you just when you have gone through it, there's no you're kind of like, well, I'm immune to it. It's fine. It's good. No, you can still you definitely. Can but how yeah. do you move through and, it? And if you and, don't feel it, you don't grow from it right? Like yeah. if you don't feel anything, you might be a little bit too medicated or something, but you have to feel <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> you got to be able to still feel and, and yet to be able to feel it exactly. If you were just, just like not feel it and carry on, you wouldn't have learned that, that that wasn't the right person for you. And that wasn't the person that was going to put forth your company the way you wanted it to be, because you absolutely needed to be the leader of this company for it to be the way that it, for the way to sell the way that it didn't do so well. And if they had put, you know, who, knows who you would have put in your place. I love that you share that, that it's okay to feel it. Cause yeah, even to this day, I feel it. I feel hurt to this day now, anytime I get rejected or anytime like a huh. friend doesn't show up for me, how I hope they would, or you know what I mean? I mean, yes. to this day, it like will destroy me inside. And yeah. I think it's good to share those things because I think a lot of people are embarrassed when they feel, when they sob their eyes out for days or they feel like it's a weakness. I don't, I don't think it is. I think or it's when you get great. rejected, that feeling of yeah. rejection is like, you know, it's ironic yeah. you share that story because we were out in LA for TV and we got a, a huge deal in February. Uh, fast forward. And yeah, our, was a year ago. Our, was the best our agents ever. were like, this is unheard of. This doesn't happen. Our agent at WME called us, you know, Fast forward to April, the deal's gone, done mm -hmm. because of life's COVID, you know, all the circumstances, maybe. Or protection. Yep. Or <laughs> protection. And it was like a major, it was like, what? You know, it was another knock, but it's again, it fueled us to go, all right, where can we go next? How can we call? So I think the feeling, what I, mm -hmm. I love about what your book and what you're talking about, and, you know, everyone needs the book because women often you see someone who has an idea and then you see the success, mm -hmm. right? So yes. I actually use Sarah Blakely as an example who I had, don't know much about, but mad respect because she obviously started it in her university room, Spanx from here to there. Mm -hmm. And, but her story is you see that she had the idea and then you see her building of like, you know, success and the in-between everyone can say I had hardships. It was really hard. I had no's. But when you can't relate to the story of a man sitting there and telling you to your face the reason you're not successful, it's very easy in your own brain because storytelling is what brings us all together. When you can actually take the humanity in someone's story, then you can re relay it to yourself and say, well, I can maybe do that because maybe your mom or dad used to say that to you that, you know, that's a pipe dream. It's never going to happen. Mm -hmm. Get a real job. So the fact that you take these real life examples and you also have your friend stories in and the book. Jamie. Can you tell us, Jamie, what was one of the greatest points of rejection and what did what is what did what happened internally that kept you going when so many people would have quit? Mm, yeah, um, I believe I, when we change our relationship with rejection, like 
we literally can change our whole lives. I, okay, I have to stop you. I'm so sorry. I have to stop you. You have to say that again. And I want to let that sink in. Then I want you to keep going. Just say, say it one more time. I want our listeners to feel that. This is like, this is, this is worth the whole, whole time. Just say it again, please. And then unpack it for us. When we change our relationship with rejection, we change our entire lives. Hmm. We change our teams. We change our business. We change, um, I believe we can never reach our true calling and our true potential and our true greatness unless we literally learn how to change our relationship with rejection. Um, and, uh, and when we see it as something that comes with the territory of being a brave one, one willing to go after your calling, one willing to go after your potential, one willing to bet on yourself and, and bet on uh, the vision God's put in you, you're a brave one. And I think that um, when you're going after anything great and anything brave, it comes with rejection. So I've literally in my life, and I still get rejected to this day, <laughs> to this day, right? And like, it, it's so funny, but I, it rolls right off me now, Craig. I, it doesn't hurt me anymore. I see it as like, yeah, it's like a reminder. Oh, I just got rejected again. Yep, I'm a brave one. I'm go. going after it. I am not going to get to heaven one day and be like, God, I lived as half as who you made me to be. God, I, I, I stepped into a quarter of my greatness. God, I know you put all these big things inside of me and I did some of them. Like, uh-uh. Like, I keep reminding myself I want to arrive there and be like, I, like, like, have nothing left. <laughs> be like I gave it my all. And so I've flipped my mindset into, mm -hmm. okay, rejection, rejection, boom, boom. I don't hear it anymore as you're not enough, right? I used mm -hmm. to always hear rejection as a, almost like a reminder of something I wish I didn't believe, which is that I'm not enough. Mm -hmm. And, and that was a really big thing to get over in my life. And so, you know, Part of launching uh, the It Cosmetics, right? Long before it was this, you know, we, we built a team of over a thousand employees, became the largest number one luxury makeup company in the country in the United States. All these things happen. A lot of people just know that part. But the real journey is a girl who literally I started believing I wasn't enough. And I, I tried to enter this beauty industry to change the conversation and help everyone feel like, oh, wait you are enough. Mm -hmm. And let's try to shift the conversation around that. But the journey was filled with so many rejections. And, you know, to talk about what, I don't even know how I could pick one. There was so, so many. And here's the thing is, is so many of the people that, that rejected me along the way were who I would consider experts, right? Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's so easy to put experts on this pedestal and be like, well, if they're telling me I don't have what it takes or they're saying I'm not going to succeed, like it's very hard not to let those words of rejection turn into self-doubt in our own heads. And so on my journey, uh, you know, of, of sending the product out to all these retailers, and I really believed in it. And um, uh, two quick rejections that stand out, one was... Um, one was after hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of rejections from, from every retailer out there. We, we got a phone call from a potential investor who's a big private equity company, um, and they got in a hold of our product and loved the product and wanted to have a meeting. And I was so excited, Craig, because I thought, oh, my gosh, they've taken so many of these unknown brands and made them into huge uh, consumer product companies that we all shop for in grocery stores and know of. And I thought if they invest, then A, I won't go bankrupt. And B, maybe they can use their leverage to get us into all of these retailers that, that keep telling me no. Um, and so we did all the meetings, meeting after meeting after meeting. We entered the diligence phase, right, which is when they start looking into all of our financial projections, our future product pipeline. And it came down to the final meeting, and my husband and I flew up for it. And um, the head guy at the private equity company, he was really kind. His whole team was awesome. Um, and at the end, he says to me, and by the way, this is now after a couple years and hundreds of rejections, right? So we're, we're at that under $1,000 in our bank account, maybe going bankrupt to any moment situation. And he, we're in person, and he was about three feet from me. And he says to me, um, you know, congratulations. You know, we, we really believe in your product. It's a great product. Uh, but it's a no, we're going to pass on investing in it cosmetics. And I was just like, oh, like devastated. Right. And I was like, okay, but I was so used to hearing no at this point. And I said, well, can you tell me why? 
um, because feedback is usually a gift. Um, I said, can you tell me why? And he got really quiet and there was a long pause. And he says, "Um, do you want me to be really honest with you? And I'm like, yes, please. And he says, I just don't think women will buy makeup from someone who looks like you with your body and your weight. Hmm. And I remember when he said those words, um, well, first of all, it was like a lifetime of body doubt, self-doubt, like flooded my Hmm. whole body. And, 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 And I never actually felt any anger toward him or anything like that. But I remember one moment that I just want to call this out because I feel like these are the moments and we all have them. We've all had someone look at us and tell us we're not enough for whatever version of rejection we've faced. And sometimes it's someone in our family who loves us and just doesn't see our dream. Sometimes it's a partner. Sometimes it's in business, but we've all had these moments. And, 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 and what I'll never forget, Craig, literally like it was yesterday is when he was saying those words to my face, he says, I just don't think women will buy makeup from someone who looks like you with your body and your weight. I got this feeling deep down in the pit of my stomach um, that said, he's wrong. Like I felt it. I felt it um, so strongly. And I still went out in my car and cried. I still, all those things. And for many years, um, you know, when I would hear those words, you know how we hear the words sometimes that someone says to us that hurt, I would Mm -hmm. like imagine myself turning down the volume on them and and turning the volume up and that feeling I had, mm. um, which I realized is a, is, is a knowing it's an intuition. It's a mm-hmm. still small voice. It's God telling us, you know, Oh, he's telling you, no, but I'm giving you a knowing, mm. right? It's that knowing we have mm-hmm. inside. And I believe our life comes down to the moments when we trust our knowing mm-hmm. over the nose, mm. our knowing over what we can't see in front of us, what, what, what looks like, you know, is it going to happen or, mm-hmm. or, or is it going to come to pass or is it, you know what I mean? And, and, right. and, and by the way, six years later, <laughs> six years later, um, and I'm skipping over so many things, but six years later, uh, when L'Oreal bought this little tiny company, I started in my living room, uh, for $1.2 billion cash. And it was their largest, uh, acquisition in the U S and U S history for them. Um, they made me the first woman to hold a CEO title in their hundred plus mm-hmm. year history of any brand. And it was a whole thing. So it was on the homepage of the wall street journal, the day that it happened um, online. And, and that's when I heard from that investor for the first time. And, uh, he said, congratulations. I hadn't heard from him in six years. Mm-hmm. And, uh, he said, congratulations. Uh, I was wrong. Yes. Um, I'm so happy and, for you. And you're so much politer than I am because I would have said to him and I'll give you 1.2 billion reasons why you're wrong. <laughs> I, love that just, so much. I, I don't, I don't recommend that anyone else says that, but I just, that's <laughs> just like, so that, good. yeah, we, we don't want to rub it in his face. How can you, how did you look at your rejections as a good thing? I love this question because honestly, <laughs> I feel like people don't share this enough. Yeah. And I feel like right now we see social media, we see everyone's highlight reel, we see all the outcomes. It's really why I wrote this book, to be honest, because like, if you Google my name, you see like, oh, Denny's waitress, a billion dollar entrepreneur. Mm-hmm. And I get so many DMs, especially from women, Lewis, so many DMs from people saying like, oh, did you get lucky? Or was that easy? Or did you have connections? And it's like, oh, wow. If we don't share the rejections and like the mm-hmm. real story and the real journey, then I feel like people feel like they're alone um, in their own rejection and their own pain and all that. So yeah, it was, um, my journey has been filled with uh, hundreds of no's, <laughs> uh, tons of rejection. And I feel like figuring out how to not take it personal mm-hmm. has been huge on the business side of things. Um, like it, it's always hurt, to be honest, it's always hurt. Uh, but also I believe, and, and no matter if someone believes in God or the universe or whatever, when I look back at everything I've gone through, especially this last 10 year window, um, there's a famous saying, rejection is God's protection. You could say Ooh. rejections is the universe's protection, right? Whatever applies mm-hmm. um, to each person listening. But like, I believe it. And it's, I mean. So that person shouldn't have said yes to you. It wouldn't have been the right fit for you. It wouldn't have been the right fit. I mean. Or the right timing yeah. or whatever. And what's hard, and, and here's the hardest thing, is so many people actually like never step out of their comfort zone because they're so afraid of rejection. Because it freaking hurts. It, it sucks does. when it happens, right? And and sometimes it doesn't make sense and it doesn't mm-hmm. feel fair. And I remember, you know, gosh, one one rejection out of hundreds <laughs> in my journey, because, you know, I, I, um, 
uh, thought I was going to be a news anchor and a talk show host my whole career. I love other yes. people's stories. Yes. Like I just want to interview you right now. Uh, <laughs> it's like since the time I was a little girl, it's all I wanted to do. And I was working in my dream job as a news anchor, and I started getting this this skin condition called rosacea, uh, which is bright red, and there's like bumps and all kinds of stuff. Um, and I thought I was going through this big setback in my career and I would be anchoring the live news and I'd hear from the producer in my ear like there's something on your face there's something on your face and I'd be live and they were like oh, you need to wipe no. it off you need to wipe it off and I knew it probably get worse yeah because the like stress more. You're like, ah. <laughs> I'm like ah and I, I knew there wasn't anything I could wipe off um, and I started going through this season of self-doubt where I started thinking okay am I gonna lose my job or I mean, am I gonna lose viewers uh, uh, is my boyfriend still going to think I'm cute? Like all those thoughts that we tell ourselves. And I started uh, thinking I was in this like big setback. But what it was really was a setup for mm -hmm. what I was supposed to do. Right. Um, and I think so often our setbacks are setups. It's just hard to see it at the time. Um, and I started, you know, trying every makeup out there from the most expensive to the least to everything. I couldn't find anything that works. And I made this decision to literally leave my dream job. Like, I think sometimes knowing when to let go of a dream is as important as knowing mm -hmm. when to go after one. And I feel like so many people are always like, just don't give up, just don't quit. But I actually think that doesn't always apply. I think that like the victory is knowing when to hear yourself mm -hmm. and trust yourself and let go of a dream or step into one. But what I didn't know is stepping into that dream would be faced with three years of of constant rejection. So from the moment I quit my job and, and my husband and I wrote our business plan on our honeymoon flight to South Africa, got back, like dove all in, uh, put everything we had into a product. And once we finally had a product that worked for me, I just thought like, oh, it's gonna sell. It's just gonna do well, right? And it was literally three years of every single beauty retailer, like all the ones I loved and the ones I thought, Oh my gosh, like I put them on a pedestal and I thought, oh, they're going to love this because it works, you know, and, and <laughs> so I would send it to Sephora and Ulta and QVC, all the places. And they all said, like every one of them said no for three years, for three years. we got down to under a thousand dollars in our bank account, which was our company and personal combined. Um, literally, it was no after no. And. I mean, one no that stands out just to share this, because anyone listening, part of you know your greatness community, like dealing with rejection, dealing with setbacks, dealing with, it's hard. Mm -hmm. When you check in with your gut, you feel like you're supposed to be going after this dream or, or creating something or launching the podcast or creating the product or whatever. It's hard when you feel like it's the right thing, but then there's no proof of success around yeah. you. No one's buying into it. No yeah. one's buying into it. And then your own self-doubt starts taking over, right? And and when you have experts telling you they don't believe in what you're doing, that's hard. And I remember um, one moment in particular when uh, we got interest from uh, a private equity firm. Mm. And I was like, I was so excited because we had had so many no's and I thought, Okay, if they invest in us, and this was a big private equity firm, they invest in a lot of like um, consumer product companies that we see at the grocery store, like, sure. like household names, right? And they invest in a lot of them pre revenue, and then they become big companies. And I'm like, oh, you know, if they invest in us, A, I won't go bankrupt. B, maybe they can get like use their leverage to get us into these stores that are telling us no, they don't yeah. want our product. And so we started the uh, meeting process with the investors and uh, went through the diligence phase and presented our product pipeline and showed our budgets. And I'll never forget the final meeting and my husband, Paulo, who you know, he was there and then the head investor was like three feet from me. Um, and I thought it was gonna be a yes, like I was so excited. <laughs> and he literally was like, you know, thank you. We're, we're really, um, we wanna congratulate you on your product. We think that it's awesome. We wanna wish you the best, but it's a no. We're gonna pass on investing in IT Cosmetics. And I was like, okay, um, can you tell me why, right? Because like feedback is usually, I mean, feedback's usually a gift, not mm -hmm. always. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I was like, can you tell me why? And he looked at me and he's literally three feet from me and he says, do you, do you really want me to be honest with you? And I said, yes, please. Um, and he says, I just don't think women will buy makeup from someone who looks like you with your, with your body and your weight, <sighs> right? And so this was a moment 
when you said that, I don't think women will buy makeup from someone who looks like you with your body and your weight. It was this moment where I was like looking at him, right? And I was, it was almost like watching his lips move in slow motion. And I remember two big things from this. I, re- I remember like my whole body flooded with like a lifetime of body doubt and self doubt. Mm-hmm. Um, and God doubt, you say? Yeah, God, everything. But, I, but yeah. it felt like I was staring my fear like mm. straight in the eye. It was almost like it wasn't even about him in this moment. Mm. Um, but, and I knew like, uh, you know, that, that two things. I remember that and I remember this moment in my gut that told me, even though I was in pain at the time and it hurt and this was like a big rejection, I also felt this really strong moment of feeling like he's wrong, like a knowing, like Mm. a deep knowing. Um, But I also knew that like if I was ever going to prove that, I would also have to truly believe it. You know what I mean? And and, uh, it was tough. I went to my car and cried um, and didn't know what we were going to do. but one thing that, and I did a lot of things wrong in my journey, and I share those in the book, but one thing that I did right was like through all the rejections, I actually never took them personal. Mm, and with really? him, mm-mm. and with him, I felt no anger toward him. And I had this big moment. So two big things happened. And then I wanted, oh, and then I want to tell you the full circle, the whole rejection is <laughs> God's protection and rejection is the universe's protection. I have to tell you like what happened. This is for anyone listening, going through a setback or a rejection right now, um, because I have hundreds of stories like this yeah. uh, in, uh, uh, now after building this company and hiring over a thousand employees and all the stuff that we've done on the way. Um, okay, so uh, <laughs> so two things. One is um, when I was creating this company, right? Um, and, and you know, you hear about a lot of you've had people on your show talking about finding your why and finding uh-huh. your mission and all that kind of thing. And everyone knows about that, and or a lot of people have read about it. Um, and I think knowing your why is important for any goal or any dream. Uh, but two things happened when I created the brand and I was like, why can't I find any product that works? Like, I don't understand this. This is when I was working as a news anchor. I had this moment where I realized, oh my gosh, my whole life, even dating, even when I was a little girl growing up, all I ever saw was uh, TV ads or magazine ads. I loved them. Like I loved them and I always saw the models and I always like aspired to look that way. Uh, but they all always had flawless skin. I never mm. saw anybody that had rosacea or any type of challenges. And I realized two things, that I always had aspired to look like them, but I, they also always made me feel uh, not enough mm. because you what never was- look like them. Or... Yeah, what was called beautiful, I didn't see myself in, right? And so I had this whole idea, which is part of why all the retailers were saying no in the early years. I had this idea to not just create products that work, but let me show models, all different people, every age, skin tone, skin challenge, gender identity, skin problems, size. Like, let me just show real people and prove this product works. Like, let me go on QVC and prove it live. Let me show my own rosacea. And I just thought, if people can see people that look like them, this just mm. makes sense to me. But all the experts said it didn't. So so back to me standing there with this investor saying, I don't think people will buy makeup from someone who looks like you with your body and your weight. After I went in my car and cried, <laughs> like it's rejection always still hurts. Uh, I also just remember feeling like, wow, he's passing on investing in my business. On He's making a business decision because of exactly why I'm starting this company. Like He's just as much, I don't want to call it a victim, but just as much impacted by, right. by the definition of beauty that's out there. And he's literally passing on investing in my company because of it. And so it drove my deep why for like why I was building this company. And I took that rejection as fuel for like, oh, this has got to change, right? And for me, it was like, let me build a company where we show all types of beauty, where, where, where it wasn't even just about selling product. It wasn't about solving my own problems. And even though I want to help millions of women and all that, the real why was like, can I shift culture and beauty mm. um, for every little girl out there mm. who's about to start doubting herself right. and every grown person who still does. And so like that drive mm. fueled it. And not being afraid of rejection is so huge and it's it's really huge for women because it, it prevents a lot of people from even trying and it hurts, it always sucks, it never feels fun. Um, but I got rejected so many times on this journey and 
to uh, finish this thought <laughs> about how rejection is God's protection. So, so the day this dude tells me this, right? Uh, fast forward six years, and uh, the day that L'Oreal bought our business for one point two billion dollars cash, it was all over. It was they had to announce it because they're a public company. So it was on the Wall Street Journal homepage. Uh -huh. It was everywhere, and I got an Did email he from email him. You? He emailed wow, me. Wow, what do you say? I got an email. He said, "Congratulations, I'm so so happy for wow. you. Um, I was wrong." And wow. uh, have you can, stayed in touch in those no, six years? Uh -uh. Not with him. With everyone else that rejected me, though, I, I did often because mm -hmm. I was always like, "It's going to be a yes. It's going to be a yes." Um, with him, here's here's, and this was six years, right, until this moment happened. But what I realized that day is it, when we talk about like rejection is is protection. Um, I was so desperate in those moments when I wanted him to invest mm -hmm. that we probably would have sold him the majority of the company for like no money because he didn't believe in us. Two things, we found out we would have been his most successful investment wow. in his firm's history. But then uh, also like by the time, because he didn't believe in us and also we got a lot more rejection on the way, by the time that L'Oreal acquired our company, we were still the largest shareholders. So it was like, Okay, <laughs> so I was so glad yeah. he didn't believe in me then. Um, but when rejection happens, it's not easy to see it in that mm. moment. It always does hurt, but I always believe. You, uh, there's so much there, and I want you to keep going. A couple things I want to unpack there. Number one is this unrealistic image for women. It's really interesting. Yeah. Um, you know, with men, it really isn't that way. If you look at football, Tom Brady has a few ads. He's the good looking dude, right? He'll, he's got a watch ad or whatever. But the guy that got all the ads was Peyton Manning. It was the every man when it comes to men. With women, these unrealistic images, especially in the beauty industry, for the most part, are the images that we see. And so you really did revolutionize an industry. That's number one. Number two, it's interesting to me that your dream was to be a broadcaster. I got to tell you, we both bagged groceries at Safeways and I was a broadcasting major in college and that was my dream. I didn't know I was going to show up 30 years later, you know, after my entrepreneurial journey. But I think life starts after your first dream is, mm. goes away. I really believe that's where you're defined. And I'm so curious about this journey with the rejection. I have a philosophy. I don't know if you agree with this. I love the title of your book, Believe It, because what you're talking about, turning up this volume on your inner voice and turning down the external rejections. Mm -hmm. Those rejections you got were over and over again. I actually, I was telling my son this, who thinks he wants to be an entrepreneur. He said, dad, what's one of the things that most people wouldn't tell you? I said, I don't know that maybe the most important thing is your ability to deal with rejection as an entrepreneur. We talk about vision, we talk about you know communication, but can you deal with the rejection? And in your case, it broke my heart, but there was one meeting you had where you thought you had a deal, finally, right, with this VC guy. And I want you guys just to feel the, 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 the depth of the rejection that you may experience as an entrepreneur. And could you do what Jamie did and still push back? So picture, years and years of rejection. You're running out of cash, you're working out of your living room, everyone's telling you no, and then this dude, almost says yes, but then really hits you with a hard no. Tell him about that. Yeah. And I thought literally he was going to be my saving grace, right? Because again, we were down to no money and we got an um, interest from, from a private equity company and they loved our products. Our product worked, like it really worked. So they loved the product um, and they wanted to have meetings. So we started going down that path and, you know, they were really big. I mean, they are really big. They, they've invested in a ton of consumer product companies that you and I buy at the grocery store and, you know, they made a lot of them household names from nothing. And I just thought, oh my gosh, if they, if they invest... A, I'm not going to go bankrupt. <laughs> yeah. B, um, maybe they'll help get me into all these retail stores that keep telling me no and keep telling me I'm not the right fit and all that. And so, you know, we did meeting after meeting and we started the diligence phase, which is, you know, right. where you show all your projections, your product pipeline, everything. And it got down to the last meeting and uh, my husband, Paulo, and I flew up for it. And I thought like, this is it, like this is going to be it. And uh, I'll never forget the head guy was about, was standing about three feet from me. And uh, he thanked me, he said, you know, that we should be proud of the product we created. Uh, and then he says to me, uh, and he's about three feet from me face to face. And he says, uh, so I want to let you know, it's a no, and we're going to pass on investing in it cosmetics. And I said, okay, like I'm used to hearing no at this point. Right. And I'm like, all right, well, you know, can you tell me why? Cause usually feedback is a gift usually. And, um, I'm like, can you tell me why? And he's like, do you, you want me to be really honest? And I said, yeah. 
And I'll never forget, like, I remember just like him looking at me for a minute and I remember feeling my heart racing really fast. Mm -hmm. And then I remember seeing his, like his lips move in slow motion. Mm -hmm. And he basically said, I just, well, he did say straight, straight to my face. I just don't think women will buy makeup from someone who looks like you, um, with your body and your weight. Oh, wow. And I remember it was this moment where for me, it was almost like this lifetime of body doubt and self doubt kind of like flooded my body and almost felt like, um, like I was staring my own fear straight in the eye, listening to him. And I, like I, A, I knew I had to keep my faith bigger than it. Uh, mm -hmm. But Ed, in that moment, like it's wild. I actually, yeah, it hurt. Like I literally went in my car in mm -hmm. the parking lot and cried my eyes out. Mm -hmm. Those things hurt. Mm -hmm. But what stands out to me in that moment, and, and I actually never felt, I didn't get mad at him. I still am not mad at him. Because guess what? The whole reason, that whole why beneath the why on why I was doing this, this company, like he literally passed on investing in my company because he had the exact same uh, mindset, right? Right? That everyone else does about what you have to look like, the box you have to fit into to be successful. And, and he's just as much a, 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 I don't want to say victim byproduct maybe of, of the whole beauty industry too. He's passing on an investment in my company because of my weight. And, and I remember this moment, but the thing that sticks out to me most is in this moment, I had this feeling, this deep, this deep feeling, like as he's telling me this, mm. um, that he's wrong. And I mm. had that feeling, mm. but I knew nothing yet that I had done <laughs> prove that because <laughs> I had no sales yet really. And I also knew like proving it would, would first and foremost hinge on me believing it uh, uh, for myself and, you know, fast forward. And, and by the way, in the years after that, like it's discipline of recognizing when, when, when someone else's voice is playing in your head all of a sudden. Mm -hmm. And I listened to a show you did actually where you, where you scratch, like you scratch it yeah. and right. And, and that's what I have to do over and over. Like I'd have to literally get really good at turning down the volume on those things because, oh, and I want to tell you a full circle moment that happened. It was so good. Um, but like, that's, I feel like that, what you, what you just shared about telling your son this advice, right? I feel like that's everything because yeah. I feel like so many people, what ends up happening is everyone else's rejections, right? End up like equating the self-doubt in our own head, our own self-doubt about ourself. We start to turn the volume up on that to the point where with all of it, with our, with, with everyone else's opinions. And mm -hmm. in my case, the lack of success around me, it can get so loud that we can't even hear our own internal knowing anymore. Mm -hmm. And I feel like so many people, uh, uh, and then you have your friends and your family, like they mean the best, but they're seeing you through their own line, their own lens of fear and an experience right and and so between all of it so many people i feel like end up literally talking themselves out of their own calling and talking themselves out of their own truth and staying in their comfort zone at like the cost of it chipping away at their soul we've all done this um and literally missing out on the person they're born to be wow. and i feel like that's and my story is like years and years and years of rejection. But when I look back at the things I did wrong and the things I did right, usually like my biggest mistakes came down to when I actually didn't listen to something I knew in my gut. And I, I decided to go with something an expert had told me when it didn't feel like quite right. Um, and the biggest successes are, are, are when I really listened to that knowing, mm -hmm. even when it went against what other people told me. So like, wow this guy telling me this, had I changed who I was, right? And, and tried to fit some mold that he said would sell. The, if that were going to be, if that was who I was authentically, then great, but it's not for me. Right. And so had I ever conformed to him or any of those retailers that told me change this, change that, and maybe we'll bring you into our store or L'Oreal that for three years of meetings said no and all the things I needed to do differently. Had I listened to most of any of that, especially the parts that didn't align with, with my gut instinct, 
I would have never sold my company for a billion dollars. I would have never, I probably would be out of business. So, so that's you hear when, yourself, when you say this, Jamie, where you're like, I would have never sold my company for a billion dollars. Still, when that comes out of your mouth, is there a part of you like, I sold my company for over a billion dollars. Does it still hit you a little bit? On one hand, I still can't process it. On the other hand, you'll understand this when mm -hmm. I say this. And you won't judge me for saying this. And yeah. I believe actually everyone in your community. Yeah. I believe they're part of your community because they'll understand this too. Mm. Um, selling your company for a billion dollars is exciting. But like for me, I don't feel like I'm put on this earth to compete with anyone else. I feel like I'm put on this earth to compete with who God made me capable of becoming. Amen. And I feel like I'm just getting started. Like yeah. I'm not there yet. Yeah. So so selling a company for a billion dollars is exciting, but like, I feel like stepping into all of who I am and serving and giving and all the things I'm really called to do, I still feel like I'm not there yet. By I the way, you talked about- I feel like okay. having watched you speak a couple of times and then listening now, I feel like all of that happened, all of the struggle, all of the ups and downs, all of the selling of the company, all you've learned, all you've been able to articulate, your broadcast background, all of that stuff is leading you right now to your time. Like, I think you were called for what you're doing now, which is teaching and inspiring people and giving them hope. However, you did say it came full circle. Yeah. What did you mean when you said that? What's the oh, full circle? Ed. Okay, you love this. Okay, so <laughs> this is so good. Because I actually never got, like, I never got mad at him, right? Because for me, it was like something bigger than him. Yeah. Um, so, so, so fast forward a few years. Um, and when we actually ended up selling to L'Oreal, uh, you know, it was their largest U.S. acquisition in their history. And so it made the homepage of Wall Street Journal, a bunch of stuff like that. And the day that the deal was announced, I got an email from him uh, <laughs> and, <laughs> and he said, you know, congratulations, you know, I was wrong. So proud of you, that, that whole thing he did. Um, and also I learned that it would, so two things, I learned it would have been the, the most successful investment in his firm's history. But here's the thing, and this is where this is where our setbacks, I feel like, oh my gosh, our setbacks, even when they suck, like it sucked to hear him say those words to me. It hurt. I cry. Like it hurts, right? Rejection in almost any form basically says to us, you're not enough. You don't belong. You're not worth, I don't think I will uh, make money off you or I don't believe in you or it comes in all those forms and it, and it sucks. But I really believe even almost all the time, when I look back at almost all the rejections, <laughs> I feel like that, like, again, those, those setbacks really are our setups. And, and, and sometimes like, sometimes rejection is, is really like serendipitous grace um, wrapped in this package labeled painful rejection. And, and what I mean by that is I was so desperate at the time. <laughs> I think you just posted, I just saw your thing where you're like, scarcity is value. Yeah. So yeah, I had no scarcity back then. I would have given him like any part of my company. We were down under a thousand dollars in our bank account. I didn't know how we were going to survive. Had he wanted to invest, had he said yes to us that day, he, I would probably give him the majority of the company for probably almost no money, just hoping to survive. But because he didn't believe in me and because we got so much rejection along the way, when we ended up selling to L'Oreal eight years into the business, um, I was still the largest shareholder. That's awesome. And so, right? <laughs> I love this. Serendipitous grace. I may mm -hmm. steal that from you. That is beautiful. Mm -hmm. And you guys have to say something. That's why you want to get this book. It's loaded with information like this. It's loaded with stories like this about believing it. Why do you need to believe it? Let's just unpack this rejection thing, and then we're going to get to a magic moment. The reason that I think your ability to deal with rejection is so important is not talked about enough. Let's just be honest. You know why 99.9% .9 of dreams die, everybody? You eventually get too much rejection. So if that's the thing that's going to cause you not to get your dream, 99.9% .9 of the time, it's just there becomes a threshold that you people don't take the rejection long enough. So they don't stick around to receive the grace. And so if that is true, if we already know that going in, then why not pre-negotiate in the, in the very beginning? What price you're willing to pay? Hopefully it's anything as long as it's legal, ethical, and moral. So that the 99.9% the, the of the reasons why your dream won't happen, you've already set in your favor if you've just decided you'll take the rejection. That's why it's such a big part. How do you take the rejection? You got to believe it.
And that's why this book is so powerful. So we lead to this point, guys. And again, the beautiful thing about Jamie's story is it's her vulnerabilities and her authenticity that made the brand relevant all the way up to the extreme magic moment. Don't hide your insecurities. Don't hide your blemishes, guys, figuratively and literally in your entrepreneurial journey. Get people wanting to root for you. Your fears and insecurities are what connect you with the marketplace. Ironically, you don't have to hide them. You can work on them, but there's nothing wrong with saying I have them. So finally, somehow you get this moment on QVC, right? And you are so brilliant in this moment. You ask them, I'll let you tell the story. But to me, it's like, if you don't do this thing, again, maybe it still doesn't hit all the way to the last second, the last moment. It was your vulnerability that connected you with the audience. Ladies and gentlemen, rock this house and welcome to the stage, Jamie Kerr. single one of us has had someone tell us we're not enough. Every single one of us has had someone say words to us that hurt. 